Hello and welcome to History Hacks, dedicated Second World War air power podcast, Hedge Hopping, with me, Matt Bone. We have a fascinating episode for you today because we're going to be looking at a subject that comes up quite often. Because on the night of the 5th and 6th of June 1944, the early hours of D-Day, thousands of paratroopers were dropped across Normandy. The history tells us how they were misdropped and how the lack of training of the troop carrier crews was a major contribution to this. But do the facts support this? So to discuss this today, I'm delighted to be welcoming Adam Berry, who's a military historian specializing in the 82nd Airborne and the 9th Troop Carrier Command, to look at the history of the men who jumped and the men who carried them into Normandy. And we're also really excited to be joined by Seb Davey. Seb is a flight lieutenant in the RAF and has the second coolest job after podcast host because Seb flies the Lancaster and pertinent to our conversation today, the Dakota as well. Gentlemen, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks very much. We'll start with Adam. How's lockdown been for you? You're not feeling too well at the moment, are you? But you're still chatting to us. <laughs> no, I've got a little bit of a gum infection at the moment, but um, living with it. Oh, sorry, my computer's making noises. Um, yeah, not too bad, thank you. Um, lockdown's been... Uh, boring but uh, we're lucky that our, our both our kids are not quite at the stage of homeschooling yet so stress levels have been i think relatively low compared to uh, a lot of people so um but yeah it's just been uh, an awful lot of staring at the inside of my house and um but because of a job i do i uh, it doesn't really change too much for me so i guess it's lockdown what lockdown for you well, there have been some aspects of it that have been slightly different. Uh, we have been uh, trying to work from home a little bit more than maybe we, we other, otherwise would. But clearly that's a little bit different, difficult for a pilot um, other than flying flight sim 2020. Uh, so uh, to, to, to a large extent, uh, lockdown hasn't particularly affected the frequency of my work. Um, uh, it has uh, impacted a little bit on our procedures uh, to, to maintain as COVID secure as we possibly can whilst operating aircraft. Which must be interesting because they're, they're not the biggest places. And you, you also fly the A400M, don't you? So it's, it's, you've got new, new and old mix, mixing things up. Yes, absolutely. So the A400M, uh, whilst a larger flight deck, is, is not, it's still not all that big. Um, uh, but we, we go through... Um, uh, we, we make the very best effort to uh, social distance as, as much as we possibly can before and after the flight and uh, clearly um, we, we have started doing uh, some level of testing uh, to make sure that we're, we're good to go uh, as a crew. Fantastic. Right, let's get into this. So let's start with Adam. The 9th Troop Carrier Command, which is a mouthful to say, yeah. Who who were they? What did they do? And where were they based once they came over? Okay, so nine nine troop carrier command were officially organized in September 1943, and they were the branch of the U.S. Air Force that would be specializing in the um, in essentially the aerial delivery of airborne troops for the U.S. Air Force or U.S. Army Air Force, as of course it was known back then, um, and uh, any other. Um, any other nations that required their services, essentially, um, which, as we know, happened quite regularly during the war. Um, they they became known as 9th Troop Carrier Command because, uh, quite simply, they were a, a tactical support unit of the US 9th Army Air Force. So they took that numerical designation from the Air Force they served under at the time. They were previously known as 12th um, Troop Carrier Command, provisional. As they when they flew in the Mediterranean, as they were operating under the uh, U.S. 12th Army Air Force at the time, and they were much smaller in terms of the number of personnel and aircraft and operational groups when they were serving in the Mediterranean in 1943. So from September 43, um, Ninth Troop Carrier Command was established, and they began to build up their forces in the U.K. Um, and by sort of roughly February March 44 time, they were they were up to strength, which was 14 operational troop carrier groups that were dotted all over the UK, really. The 52nd Troop Carrier Wing were predominantly East Midlands. So um, they had five groups that were based in uh, bases that were in Rutland, Northamptonshire, Lincolnshire, and technically speaking, I believe Nottinghamshire, 
Seb's probably quite familiar with a few of them because it's, they were well up until recently both active RAF bases, uh, one of which was Cottesmore in Rutland, which was home to the 316th Troop Carrier Group, whose aircraft are behind me in the image. I don't know if you can see that on the podcast, I just realised that. <laughs> um, uh, RAF Barkston Heath, which is Lincolnshire, which I believe is still active RAF. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then the other bases are now uh, essentially either utilised as well, mainly go-kart tracks or have been returned to agriculture. But then you've got a number, you've, the remaining two wings of nine troop carrier command were down in, in sort of Wiltshire, Berkshire area uh, and as far across as uh, Devon. Um, so there was a nice spread of troop carrier bases along the sort of sub, in the southern areas um, west of London. And that was where they were based. So they would they tried to uh, obviously accumulate troop carrier bases in areas where um, the Allied Airborne Divisions were being trained or were encamped prior to D-Day. So the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing were in the East Midlands um, because that was where the 82nd Airborne Division were camped at the time, around the Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire area. And um, the 52nd Wing had dropped the 82nd over Sicily and over Italy. So they'd got some um, some cop, um, prior cooperation before D-Day, but got a, a reasonably well-established working partnership, if that makes sense. The other two wings were in the vicinity of the area where the uh, 6th Airborne Division were being trained for D-Day. And of course, the 101st Airborne Division, which had been in, in the country since around September 43 as well. So the, the whole purpose of their sort of distribution across the UK was, of course, so that they could carry out regular training exercises with with the airborne divisions that were stationed at that time in the UK. So their tool of choice for this was the, the C-47, which in RAF parlance was the Dakota. Uh, yes, although um, there were some, believe it or not, there were some sceptics as to whether or not it was the right platform for the job. And this actually came about following the, the, the sort of disastrous misdrops that took place over Sicily um, in 1943 but mainly because of the effects of the friendly fire incident over Sicily, where the, um, the US Navy and some land-based anti-aircraft batteries shot down um, just over 20 um, American C-47s during the second big lift during Operation Husky. A lot of questions were raised over the aircraft's ability to sustain anti-aircraft fire. And there was a, a quite lengthy report made that included high-ranking officers from the US Army, Air Force, RAF, uh, U.S. Army, British Army, um, and the U.S. Navy um, that summed up essentially what had happened, what had taken place um, in this friendly fire incident. And as part of this document, they actually um, go into some detail about um, whether or not they should start using the, believe it or not, the B-24 Liberator as the main platform for deploying paratroopers uh, in future combat operations, um, and the, the opinion was that the Liberator was better at sustaining anti-aircraft fire. Um, there are some 8th Air Force historians that might argue that that might not necessarily be the case, and that the B-17 was probably more likely to sustain fire better, but the B-17 didn't present itself well as a, a platform for deploying um, paratroopers in combat like the B-24 potentially could. Um, so, yeah, uh, but by the time D-Day comes around, the C-47 is very much the, 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 the aircraft of choice. Um, and the reason is because it presents itself as an absolutely ideal platform for deploying paratroopers. It's got an em a large, empty, open cabin um, for the paratroopers to sit um, and to deploy from, a large cargo door to jump from, and... And not only that, it's it's built in the right sort of numbers that, that make it ideal for for this sort of job. Obviously, the B twenty four was being built as a primarily as a heavy bomber, and um, the the potential um, logistics behind modifying the aircraft for paradrops would have been quite monumental. So, yeah, the C forty seven may well have been a um, you know basis of a pre war design, um, the DC three, um, but it's it lent itself really well as, as, a, as a, a platform for deploying paratroopers. Having smashed my head in both 
the B-17 and the B-24, I would not want to try to <laughs> jump out of that. Um, yeah, to get out of them was bad enough without a kit bag and parachutes and things. Yeah, I mean, it would have, it would have without doubt, have brought uh, a huge number of problems, um, you know, gear snagging. I mean, given the weight of the equipment, as, as well, I'm sure we'll, we'll get onto the, the weight of the equipment that American paratroopers tended to jump with. Um, I can't imagine getting out of a B-24 would have been particularly easy at the best of times, let alone in a combat situation when there's a, an awful lot of um, lead being flown, thrown at the aircraft from the ground. So, yeah, you can see why the decision was ultimately made not to go down that route. Seb, yeah, you've got more hands-on experience than both of us on the Dakota. We just, just for the listener who will tweet me to say, well, the Americans called it the C-47. We're going to be using the two interchangeably today because, well, it's my show and we can. Um, but Seb, the Dakota that you fly, how what what's 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 she like? Describe her, describe her to us. Well, um, she's a very solidly built aircraft. Uh, the the particular example that we've got was built uh, in um, 1942 in California, uh, and she's done only about 16,000 hours. But there are Dakotas all over the world that have flown. Uh, approaching 100,000, if not more, 100,000 hours. So clearly a very strongly built aircraft. And, and the fact that there's so many survived today um, is probably, you know, when you compare it to the number of Lancasters, for example, that survived today, or the number of um, uh, other sort of war, warbird large aircraft, uh, the, the Dakota um, has, has stood the test of time, really. Funnily enough, she's used with us as a training aircraft. Um, it's a training. She's a training aircraft for um, flying, flying the Lancaster itself. So, but we do, we do realise that she's very much a display aircraft in her own right. Um, and in fact, she's the third oldest air, aircraft at the BBMF and uh, the the old, oldest air transport aircraft in the Royal Air Force. So um, we do realise that she's a, she's very special in terms of flying her. Tail draggers have very different characteristics, uh, specifically on the ground compared to uh, the, the more common tricycle uh, aircraft, that, that uh, tricycle undercarriage aircraft that are in use uh, today around the world. Um, but apart from this, she's, she's, a, she's a really uh, quite a, a docile um, animal, to be honest. Um, she's lovely to fly. Um, I identify with her uh, a great deal because it's the aircraft that my predecessors in my frontline role in the Air Force for the last 20 years is the aircraft that they flew doing essentially my job 75 years ago. So it's a real honour and a privilege to be able to um, uh, fly uh, the aircraft that my predecessors did. In terms of handling, like I say, she's, she's fairly docile. She's, she's fitted with the military uprated engines, which means that she is uh, quite sprightly as well. And uh, she's she's a real real pleasure to fly. To be honest, uh, she's a perfect. It's it's almost as if you know her role hasn't finished with the end end of the Second World War. She's the perfect training aircraft for for the Lancaster as well. So she's she's still pro providing valuable service other than just going to air shows. I was lucky enough to to visit the BBMF when you had a MN two three five after she came back from Canada, and I did have a s sneaky walk around. Your Dakota, because she is absolutely stunning. Yes, uh, yeah, she's she's very well looked after, as are all of our aircraft, due to our outstanding team of engineers who who pretty much treat them as, as their children. Um, not that we don't, because we do the same. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they they let you pilots borrow them from time. Well, to time. yes, and I'm sure if you spoke to them, they'd say um, we're very effective at breaking them for them to fix. <laughs> I guess for, for most people, the, the last time they saw her was at Captain Tom's funeral a couple of weeks ago, yes. which was which was a lovely flight. Yes, absolutely. It wasn't me that did the fly past. It was um, one, one of our other, or one of my colleagues, uh, Flight Lieutenant Neil Farrell. But um, as a flight, we were very, very proud to be taking part in, in that event. This actually leads us very nicely onto training. Adam, let's start with you. This is sort of where a lot of the, the current conversation comes in about the you know the best troops being dropped by the the worst trained crews that's not really the case is what sort of training would the crews have gone into in the states when they came here we've already talked a bit about the being based near to where the the airborne was but what funneled the pilots and crews into the the troop carrier corps 
so one of the suggestions has been that like you say that the um that through the aviation cadet program in the states the the sort of lower scoring pilots were generally speaking pushed towards transport aircraft um and from from what myself and particularly a number of others that, that study the, the troop carrier groups have found is that there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that that's true the way that the, the aviation cadet program worked with the americans in particular back in the war was that a pilot was very much judged on on not just their um ability as a pilot but in order in order to find themselves on a particular platform um their weight and their height and various other physical attributes were considered so as an example um fighter pilots if, if you join the air corps in hope of being a fighter pilot if you were five foot ten and weighed 165 pounds your luck was out the americans had a very strict um parameters that uh, a fighter pilot could not be any more than six foot nine uh, sorry, five, five foot nine, six foot nine is very big for a fighter pilot. Um, five foot nine, and they couldn't weigh more than 160 pounds. So just to give you an idea, um, I always use it as an example. It's a bit of a weird example, but but that would that would mean that somebody like Dick Winters, for example, the famous Dick Winters from Band of Brothers, could never have been a fighter pilot. Um, and he's exactly the sort of guy that people people turn to as a as an icon and as an idol for, for the right reasons. But, but Mr. Winters could, could never have been a fighter pilot. He would have been very disappointed if he'd joined the Air Corps. So again, bomber pilots, conversely, were, were, were chosen for their um, stamina, for their strength. Um, Seb might be able to testify as to the difficulties in flying a, a four-engined aircraft, a big heavy bomber over long distances, long missions, um, takes a lot of stamina, um, a lot of um, mental stamina as well. Um, particularly on missions where you are being targeted by enemy flak for a lot of it. Um, and of course, you know, these aircraft are not fly by wire. If they lose an engine or they suffer damage in any way, they become more difficult to fly. You know, it, it can take a lot of, as I say, uh, physical stamina and physical strength in order to bring the aircraft safely home. So again, anyone that, that presented themselves as being the ideal bomber pilot was, was pushed in the direction of sort of four engine bombers every every candidate was given a uh, an intelligence test um the 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 the, air, the aviation cadet program had a slightly better way of wording it than i just have but um um and and pilots and air crew actually were the ones that didn't score particularly high on the intelligence tests um, with the aviation cadet program not that that's in any way shape or form a, a reflection of their intelligence as a whole but those that scored higher were generally speaking pushed towards navigational school or they, they didn't become air crew at all they ended up on ground roles uh, meteorologists uh, engineers that sort of thing so a, again the suggestion that that you know the air crew were you know less intelligent or not as capable of flying an aircraft as, as some others doesn't really ring true in that regard um another thing as well is that um is that in terms of the classes that, that graduated from the aviation cadet program, it would be it would be U.S. Army Air Force during the war. The, the troop carrier, the, the, many of the pilots that ended up becoming troop carrier pilots during the, during the you know for the G, for the D-Day missions or those beyond, graduated in places higher in their class than guys that ended up being B-17, B-24 pilots. Some ended up being fighter pilots, and many that scored higher than that ended up not joining the war effort at all in, in an operational sense they just they remained in the states as um, as instructors um so and then of course you've got to consider the pilots that were were drafted in on account of pre-war flying experience so a lot of the squadron commanders group commanders um even even some of the guys that were just simply i say simply uh, first lieutenant second lieutenant in rank captain in rank um were pre-war DC-2 or DC-3 airline pilots. And of course, when they're brought into the US Army Air Force or they volunteer for it, any prior experience is assessed by the Air Force. And of course, if you've flown, as some guys had, 10, 11, 12,000 hours on DC-3s, there's only one place the Air Force is gonna send you. And that is flying the C-47 because essentially it's the same aircraft. Um, so some of the guys that, um, as I say, some of the guys that commanded the squadrons or the groups, in fact, 
most of them that had commanded squadrons or groups during the war had flown the aircraft as the DC-3 before the war commenced. Um, glider pilots similarly um, had got a service pilot racing, which meant that they had pre-war flying experience and often was the case. Uh, most of a lot of the glider pilots that came into service with the US Air Force during the war were former display pilots, or um, I think they used to refer to them as barnstormers during the uh, the pre-war years. Guys that had got, um, some might argue, a bit more bravery than sense, which is what a lot of glider pilots may have needed during the war, um, which worked out well for the US Air Force. Um, so yeah, there's 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 no suggestion really that they were sort of lower grade pilots, and, and particularly when you reach a period of around May forty three time, when the um, the initial plans for D-Day were being put together, the U.S. Air Force and the RAF and and well, but the Allied forces in general realised that in order for what was being planned for D-Day to be attainable, a considerably larger troop carrier force was needed. Um, and at the time, the Americans only had six troop car operational troop carrier groups, two of which were with a wing that never actually even left the Mediterranean. Um, well, prior to D-Day, didn't leave the Mediterranean at all, so weren't involved on D-Day. That meant the US Air Force had to establish and train and build up the forces for 10 more troop carrier groups between May 1943 and essentially February 1944, so that they could give themselves enough time to train in the UK with the airborne forces. So anyone that had gone through twin engine pilot training in the US, um, in the Air Force's aviation cadet program, essentially found themselves on C-47s because establishing the air crew for the, um, for the establishment of the troop carrier groups became, you know, mission number one for the US Air Force at that stage. Seb, just on modern day selection for various types, it's... It's very much based on aptitude as opposed to desire to be in a fast jet, isn't it? Uh, well, the Air Force tends to select people on the basis that they are uh, able to fly any aircraft that is in the Air Force inventory. Um, it's rare that we would be so selective as the uh, as the US or so uh, targeting in, in terms of our selection uh, as the US Air Force were back then. Um, so uh, Adam, for example, mentioned that if you were taller than five foot nine, you, you couldn't be a fighter pilot. These days, if, 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 you were, if you fell outside the bracket to be able to fly any aircraft in the Air Force, it would be unlikely that you would be accepted at all. Um, what the Air Force wants is, is, what the Royal Air Force wants is flexibility for those people to, to go to any platform or the platform that they are most suited to, um, irrespective of what we call their um, anthropometric uh, characteristics. So, so, so actually we tend to select people on the basis that they are able to fly uh, any aircraft type uh, that's currently in the inventory. The Dakota is quite a, a small flight deck actually. There is more, I would say there was more room in the Lancaster, on the Lancaster flight deck than there is on the Dakota one. In particular, you feel as if you're fitting, you're sitting extremely close to the, the front windscreen. Uh, initially, when you go onto the, the Dakota flight deck, it looks like a very small letterbox for the, for the air crew to, or the pilots to, to see out of. But when you realise how close you sit to the windscreen, um, clearly that field of view opens up because you're it's like pressing your face against a window you can definitely see more than if you're standing two feet away from it so from that from that from that point of view it's quite interesting that um the the uh u.s air force of the, of the time selected people or so selected people's aircraft type on the basis of what shape they were which, which i find find quite fascinating really adam how much training did they have together with the troops they were going to drop before before d-day before D-Day, a lot, a lot more than people think they did. It was training with airborne forces was a huge issue for the US Air Force prior to D-Day. So the misdrops over Sicily um, were pretty much attributed down to the lack of training time that the air crew had, particularly for the navigators. But before D-Day, that's certainly something that can't be argued. So as, as I mentioned earlier, nine troop carrier command consisted of three troop carrier wings, and uh, eight, two of those wings had five groups, the other one had four. So across, um, across all of those groups, 
from um and I'm, I'm having to remember the dates exactly off my head now which I, I know i won't be able to do but um from around the end of march up until around the end of may or mid-may they carried out 33 combined ground air training exercises which means um airborne and troop carrier training exercises in which they dropped a a live cargo <laughs> um which obviously is ideal because you know a, a live cargo can tell you where it landed um which gives them a you know a, a good basis from which to um determine the success or 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 there or, or otherwise of a um, of a training exercise providing they can read a map you are sorry providing they can read a map provided they, can, they can read a map yeah yeah or provided that they knew where, where they were after they'd landed it's um yeah so it's so yeah, they they, they carried out thirty three combined. Uh, these these were official, so these were organised at 9th Troop Carrier Command level. So, and the airborne forces that they dropped across those exercises were not limited at all. They dropped the one hundred first, the eighty second, both British airborne divisions, the first and sixth, and the Polish first independent um, parachute brigade were were dropped as part of the the training prior to D Day. And of course, one one thing that not not many people are, are overly familiar with is the fact that the first airborne division are obviously well known for 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 operations earlier in the war but of course mainly for market garden but what not many people know was there were plans in place to drop the first airborne division into normandy um some days after d-day so training with the first airborne division was pretty paramount as well they wanted to be really clued up with with the way the british airborne in particular worked um, I think, the, as far as I can recall, the reason that that was cancelled was because the drop zone was was fairly close to Corn and the the difficulties that the British were having in, in capturing that town at the time and the, 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 the position of the German forces meant that the flak would have been um, considerably too heavy for the drop to be successful. That's, put, that's putting it mildly. That would not it, have been a drop you would have wanted. No, it would have. It, 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 I, th I think that would have been a pretty catastrophic. A catastrophic drop even even if carried out in in daylight which i think the plan was um it would have been you know um it would have been a terrible um a terrible loss of of, of, of men and machines if that had been carried out um so yeah i mean that like i say that was it that was at command level so the wings were were in a position where they could they could organize their own training exercises without um without command approval necessarily and and also the groups were allowed to go up whenever they found that the weather was favourable. So one example I always use is the uh, 315th Troop Carrier Group who were operating out of RAF Spanho in uh, Northamptonshire, which is um, it's still a, a, a hobby airfield now. Um, they, they only had two squadrons um, operational, believe it or not, a month before D-Day. Every other group in 9 Troop Carrier Command had four squadrons of aircraft. The 315th only had two. So they formed two more at the end of April and the beginning of May, respectively, for the two squadrons, um, which gave them just over a month to prepare for D-Day. Um, in the month of May, um, the 315th flew 18 formation flights, uh, formation flight training exercises, three of which were carried out with paratroop cargo in, in the month of May alone. Now, one of the things that the 315th found was that when you're flying, when you're trying to maintain a really tight formation, which is necessary for um, for dropping paratroopers over a, over a drop zone, they found that if the weather was anything less than perfect, the undulation between the aircraft in flight on each other's wings was so vast that that you could look out the window, what look out the cockpit window one minute and see an air, the aircraft on your wing is, you know, fifty feet above you, and then you know, look out two seconds later and it'd be 50 feet below you. It was, they, you know, they were bobbing up and down in the air. And again, for a paradrop, that's just not ideal at all. So the reason that they carried out so many formation flights in the month of May was to prepare for that and to practice it and to familiarise themselves with, with being able to judge when the aircraft was going to suddenly jump and or descend. And they, they were commanded by a guy called Major Smiley Stark, a very uh, a very American name, um, who was a, a captain and was actually quite an experienced pilot with the 315th, who had never dropped paratroopers before Normandy, um, but he'd flown with the group um, in you know a number of um, supply flights and search and rescue flights in Greenland and knew the aircraft like the back of his hand. 
after this formation flight in which they'd realized you know that, that flying in formation in less than perfect weather was very difficult um he got all of his pilots old and new into um into the the, the base gym at spano where they often held mass briefings and um and basically just said look guys we are going to be expected to be amongst the very best and we're going to be dropping the very best of um you know in terms of ground forces so we've got a lot of work to do so they they got to it basically and made sure that whenever the weather was suitable they were in the air flying and on the odd occasion that they weren't flying it was either because the good old english weather wasn't appropriate for it or alternatively they'd flown a night formation that night before so the pilots were obviously tired and on those days they basically held classroom lectures where they you know they learned various other aspects of flying the aircraft or various aspects of you know what it took to deliver an airborne force into combat so and the 315th were one of the most successful groups on d-day they dropped the first battalion of the 505th the only regiment that had got prior experience before d-day in terms of a combat in terms of combat and dropped almost the entire battalion on the money so you know for a group that only had two operational squadrons just a month just over a month before d-day they performed incredibly well and you know i always argue with people i say argue debate with people that you know this wasn't down to luck it wasn't down to the fact that the 505th were the only only regiment with experienced pathfinders it happened because you know they trained very hard to be able to do that just to bring Seb in here on, on formation flying, as as the layman that I am, um, we are very sort of used to seeing, say, the red arrows and wonderful shots of of, of yourselves um, on the on the BBMF flying in beautiful formation. That's a lot of art and a lot of skill rolled into one to to keep formation on another aircraft, isn't it? Um, yes, I mean, in one respect, it's quite simple. You keep the picture of the other aircraft. Uh, in exactly the same position uh, as much as you can. That's that's the, the essentially the basis of formation flying. You have uh, what we call formation references and uh, you maintain them uh, as, as, as closely as possible. And you know how to make the adjustments when one of them looks uh, out, of, you know, one of them is, is out, of, out of kilter uh, for whatever reason. But it is definitely a skill that needs practicing. And so the, the the commander of the 315th was absolutely right to send his guys up uh, 18 times in May because uh, it is definitely a skill that um, you can improve over time. Um, I think that was a, a really good move. Another point I'd like to bring out here is that completing a successful power drop, whether that was in 19, the 1940s or now, because my, back, my background before A400M is, is uh, C-130, and one of our main roles was to, to drop paratroopers. It's not by accident that you, you complete a successful drop. It takes a lot of planning and it takes um, quite a lot of skill in, in the flying as well, in terms of speed control, in terms of accurate height, because any, any, any height difference to, to the planned one uh, will just in, introduce errors in terms of um, where, the, where the canopies go according to the wind. Any, any errors in terms of calculations will, uh, as to where the release point is will, will create um, errors that get amplified whilst the paratrooper is dropping to the ground. So anyone who, su who suggests that those Dakota pilots in 1940 just happened to luck in and get it right is is probably a, a little misguided on, on the subject I, I would suggest uh, because even with the tech, technology that i had on the c-130j you, you you had to be you had to fly accurately and you and you had to fly uh, smoothly uh, and it was one of our key considerations when we were planning an, a, a, an insertion mission um, was what is our route to get there because there is no point in delivering a plane full of air sick paratroopers um, so uh, it was very much a trade-off between um, a route to, to get there at low level in terms of terrain masking and all the rest of it, and the ability for the paratroopers to arrive fit to fight. You know, it was um, it was definitely a consideration that was a key in in our minds. The other thing is that it's it's, it's wonderful listening to to Adam about some of the, the, the procedures that they, they had back then, because so many of them read forward into, into modern day tactical air transport flying in terms of 
the formation flying requirement, the, the accuracy requirement, uh, the, the planning and the management that goes into a formation to, to drop that number of paratroopers onto a drop zone. Um, and and, it, and it's, it, it, it's, they are facets that were, are just as true today as they were all those years ago. Let's get into that night of nights. Well, actually, we're going to be talking about the night before the night of nights, because what were the plans for the original drop on the, the 4th and 5th of, of June? Because we do have that 24 hour delay, which which makes everything very interesting. But what were the night's orders? Um, you've already mentioned who they were going to drop, but let's reiterate that. And where were they going? Which is going to play very much into the next chunk of our discussion tonight. Tonight, this afternoon, it's only five. <laughs> this afternoon, yeah. <laughs> getting, getting towards night. Or at whatever time you're listening to this episode, it's then. So night, night Troop Carrier Command, as I mentioned, they operated 14 Troop Carrier Groups on D-Day. 13 of those were assigned to dropping the parachute echelons of two American Airborne Divisions over Normandy. So the 101st and the 82nd Airborne Divisions, and then that, that one solitary final group was doing the only, the only sort of nighttime uh, or early hours glider tow mission on on d-day to bring in what were considered to be more of the um more of the vital um immediately necessary supplies or equipment or men or personnel um that had to be flown in by a glider in the early morning hours of d-day so but their primary role in, in particular in those early mornings is to get the paratroopers of the two divisions down so they they were utilizing six drop zones and effectively, the six drop zones reflect the six parachute regiments that, that operated across both divisions at the time, even though the 101st and those that are, that are more clued up on the operational um, the sort of planning of the 101st would know, would know the reasons why. But for some reason, with two of the regiments of the 101st, they shared two drop zones, so they were mixed. Um, but the 82nd very much had um, three drop zones, one, one each for each of the regiments. And um, so the 101st were, uh, their primary role was, was to capture some of the causeways inland of what became known as Utah Beach, um, which was the furthest west of the five invasion beaches, um, and was on that crop of land, the Cotentin Peninsula, which, which was almost like the, a finger pointing out from northern France towards England, um, and that set of coast, that area of coastline heads up towards Port Cherbourg. And the 4th Infantry Division were due to land on Utah Beach and to sort of ease their progress coming inland. The, the 101st had to capture a number of causeways because, uh, as, as we all know, anyone that's got a vague interest in D-Day knows that the, the Germans flooded much of that area of Normandy. Um, and those causeways were the only exposed roads coming inland from the coast. Um, and conversely, one of their objectives was the capture of the Lab Arquette Lock, which is what the Germans had used to... Uh, to flood that area of Normandy. The 82nd was, was slightly further inland. Um, and generally speaking, the consensus is the reason for this was because they um, they well, one of their regiments and and particular their glider infantry regiment that came in the day after D-Day um, had prior combat experience before. So they, they knew more what to expect. And, and generally speaking, um, their, their objectives were slightly tougher. And if things didn't get a plan on D-Day, they, they were the, the more susceptible division to essentially not finding a way out, um, which obviously would have been um, would have been unfortunate because the, the 82nd were a, were, a, were a pretty good division by that point. So yeah, the, 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 the command's job is to is to get the, the three the, the two sorry the two airborne American airborne divisions down on the deck um, in such a way that they can achieve their objectives essentially before either the 4th Infantry Division land on Utah Beach or before they've moved west enough to secure the, the more key objectives. And that meant basically deploying um, a, a Pathfinder force. So um, it, was a, it, well, it wasn't the first time that, that American Pathfinders were, were used, but it was the first time that such a force of Pathfinders had been used um, to mark each drop zone. Um, and of course, the difficulty is if those guys don't land in the right place, then it means, generally speaking, the rest of the guys have got a difficult job of landing in the right place. Um, and then around about 30 minutes later, the main serials of aircraft um, began dropping the, 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 the bulk of paratroopers over the, the six drop zones in Normandy. The 101st were the first division over 
Um, and then they were preceded about 40 minutes and to an hour later by the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, and by, I think it was around about quarter to two on D-Day, all of the regiments were on the deck. So that serial of C-47s was, was almost non-stop. But the first drops happened around about half past, half past midnight. So for about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half, there's a constant stream of C-47s flying overhead. And I can only guess as to what that would have felt like being a German on the ground. The initial power drops from the Pathfinders might have led them to believe that there was some sort of commando raid taking place. But when the remaining serial started to appear over Normandy, there must have been this sudden realisation that it wasn't just a commando raid, there was something quite serious happening. And this, this it's it's so difficult for us to imagine what, what that noise would have been like, but there was something like eight, again, trying to remember, trying, trying to remember the number exactly, 821 C-47s flying that night, carrying just the American airborne divisions in a, in a constant stream. Um, it's, it's unimaginable to, to, to appreciate, you know, what that would have sounded like what that would have felt like on the ground. Um, so yeah, in summary, that was what their jobs on D-Day were. So what, what did what did the 24 hour delay do besides hopefully give them better weather? Did that really throw things out of, out of whack a bit? Um, not really, no. I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that the only thing that that might have affected was, was, was nerves maybe. You know, it, by that point, the air crew and the paratroopers had been fully briefed on what laid ahead. So they knew what was to come, and and I think with with the twenty four hour stand down, gave them more time to ponder what lay ahead, um, and more time to absorb the the um, the magnitude of it all. But in terms of the actual the actual mission itself, yes, the twenty four hour delay gave gave them more favourable weather. Although you know, as 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 we know, it, it didn't give them. It didn't give them ideal weather. They still had to deal with some unexpected on on D Day, but but really are the catalyst of what became the mist drops on D Day. They are, you know, the, the poor weather and the, and the cloud bank on the west coast of Peninsula is what essentially begins that that cascade of events that caused the mist drops on D Day. And I, th I think that's a, an important thing to bring out is we're talking about the west side of the Cotentin Peninsula because they flew a, quite a big dog leg out towards the Channel Islands before cutting in. Um, I, having discussed this with a few people, it's not a straight line. And Seb, you, you mentioned this before, that that training and planning for the, the route to, to make sure you deliver your 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 self-unloading cargo, I suppose we could call a paratrooper, um, in the right sort of way would have been very, very precise to make sure that that was carried out properly. I think it probably would have been less of a consideration for D-Day itself in that the, the routing wouldn't have been quite as uh, aggressive as if you were doing terrain masking uh, to sh shield yourself from, from radar. I, I, I guess the, the transit was carried out at a reason, reason sort of medium altitude um, where the air is, is generally a little bit smoother. So, um, but, but it would have been a key consideration uh, in, in terms of delivering the effect that they wanted. Uh, and, and I'm sure that all of the, the Dakota crews uh, realised that their aim was not just to fly an aircraft over northern France, it was to deliver the fighting force in a fit state to, to carry out their mission. So we've mentioned weather and that cloud bank that was just off the coast there is interesting. It is kind of looks like a bit of a special effect in Band of Brothers, but we won't get into that. Seb. Flying in weather, even today, is not just flying through a cloud, is it? There's weather and aircraft aren't always the best of best of bedmates. Um, we have to be very careful with the weather with our, with with our historic aircraft because we aren't actually permitted to fly uh, in cloud in in our aircraft. Certainly not uh, particularly thick cloud uh, for several reasons. Now, now one of those is because you obviously can't see where you're going and if you're flying the aircraft based on uh, the picture outside the window then you don't have any references to to make make sure that you're the right way up for a start so there were there were some very basic instruments on the flight deck uh, that they could have used uh, sort of artificial horizons uh, 
um, to make make sure that the aircraft was flying straight and compasses and and, and they they would have been trained I would imagine in, in in basic instrument flying but there are other hazards associated with with weather as well um, not so much an issue in June I would suggest but but icing um, can can cause a very great penalty to aircraft performance and certainly with these Dakotas um, loaded up to probably pretty much their maximum design takeoff mass um, any any loss in performance of the wing would have meant either a loss of speed or a loss of height um, neither of which would be particularly conducive to uh, a, a, a nice situation when you're flying in formation with 820 other aircraft and that is another key point as to, to what would have made flying in cloud dangerous is unless they were in particularly close formation and able to see the other aircraft um, these clouds may have had what we might refer to as nutty centers which <laughs> which were other aircraft and 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 you know a key part like like i've banged on about throughout this this whole podcast the key part of the mission was to deliver the paratroopers to have their effect it's it's no good having a, a mid-air collision before you get to the drop zone because you're 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 not you're not carrying out the mission so um weather would have been a severe hamper to them especially without the modern you know the modern day flight instruments that we have and, and airliners have to be able to fly in cloud um you know you see these days air, aircraft auto landing at international airports in practically zero visibility and clearly that, that technology did not exist at that time there was no gps there was no uh inst instrument landing system or guidance systems particularly there was no not very accurate radar at all so so all of these modern day pieces of equipment that we use to fly in cloud perfectly safely just didn't exist for them so so flying weather weather would have been a, a much uh, had much more of an impact for, for them than, than than it does today definitely absolutely without without doubt adam let's talk about that what happened when they hit the cloud and then when they came straight out the other side of it and <laughs> stuff happened uh, the, the question might might be better place what didn't happen i mean the the, the cloud bank the, the cloud bank's key because they're not they don't know it's going to be there so so they're briefed that their that their flight route to to normandy which you quite rightly pointed out was was a, a sort of a dog leg around to the west coast they flew between the islands of uh, Alderney and guernsey um at intervals that essentially they were flying in a channel that the allied planners had had, had indicated would would bring them outside of the reach of German anti-aircraft fire which on those two islands was pretty intense um, so if anyone's been to Guernsey or Jersey or any of the Channel Islands they're caked in German fortifications and bunkers and the Germans had some pretty formidable anti-aircraft batteries on those islands so flying the C-47 route um, flying the, the, the serials between those islands doesn't seem like the greatest idea but supposedly they were out of out of reach out of touch um and it, that proved to be the case luckily but as soon as they hit the west coast um they, they hit a really 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 dense um cloud bank um one veteran of the 316th troop carrier group which flew out of RAF Cottesmore on D-Day um referred to it as a wall of fog um so depending on which group's um unit history you read or which which group's war diary you read um it was anywhere from around about 500 feet to uh, two and a half thousand feet so as a pilot you're suddenly faced with something you're not briefed to expect um, and you have to make a, a very sort of snap decision on what you're going to do next the, the troop carrier formations um seb might be able to tell me whether or not that the, the dac has it now but american c-47s in the war had what they called formation lights so when they were flying in a v of v formation um they knew they were at the correct interval to the other aircraft when they could see those lights Otherwise, the lights aren't visible, and obviously there's there's reasons for that. I don't know whether or not Seb can confirm whether or not the DAC, so, sorry, still has that light on it. I don't believe they are fitted to our D Dakota, but uh, that, that that does make total sense in terms of they would need some sort of formation reference to ensure that they were keeping station with the other aircraft if, if that's where they wanted to be. It, it was obviously pretty vital for them because they were, you know, at, at that point in the war, they'd carried out a number of nighttime drops and obviously, D, you know, the, the drop on D-Day was was in the darkness hours of June 6th. So the formation light's pretty vital. 
So when they enter the cloud bank, those formation lights in many cases just become um, invisible to them. They, they can't see the other aircraft that they're flying in formation with. Um, the Americans had a, had a procedure of flying in which the pilot never took his eyes off the aircraft he was flying in formation with. So um, the co-pilot was responsible for looking ahead and looking at whatever else they needed to look at, terrain features, all that side of things. The pilot's job was to keep a solid bead on the aircraft he was flying in formation with so that he knew he was always at the correct intervals. Um, and when they enter this cloud bank, the pilot loses the ability to do that completely. So American, well, it wasn't just troop carrier formations, uh, you know, most US Air Force formations and I would suspect other, other, other Air Force formations were taught to do something called fanning out the formation where they would essentially increase the intervals between the aircraft to um, limit the risk of them colliding. For some aircraft that meant ascending, for some it meant descending, some it meant flying to port or starboard, whatever, but it depended on their position in the formation, but they were trained to do it. And, but, but, but getting that correct is, and, and, and knowing that by, you know, once you've made those corrections in terms of the formation that you're still flying in the correct direction, is not as easy as, as some people might think. You also have to consider that, you know, every, every, only one in every four or five C-47s at night was flying with a navigator on board, which just makes that even more difficult. On the aircraft where there's no navigator, the co-pilot is having to keep an eye on the compass bearing, on, um, on the, the intervals between what they call the initial points, the IPs, the changes in course, in other words. So it, again, when they're having to suddenly um, you know, what do we do now? Um, there's this sudden flash of, of, of dilemmas in front of their eyes of what to do once they hit this cloud bank. They're presented with three options, realistically. The first option is to descend. And in, in, in many cases, this would mean descending below 500 feet. At 500 feet, you begin to lose, you begin to lose some of the key features that you're using to navigate towards your drop zone, primarily that you can see the terrain below you and use the terrain features as a way of navigating. And of course, the other thing is, is that you're more susceptible to our, uh, enemy ground fire. And we, we know from statistics that at least 55, 60% of aircraft that were brought down on D-Day were brought down by small arms fire. They weren't brought down by, you know, heavy flak, the sort of flak that you see in Memphis Bell and that sort of thing, you know, they were brought down by, because they were flying at 500 feet, the Germans, you know, pointing their MGs at the sky and sending a train of MG ammunition up towards the aircraft. And, you know, a, a bullet hole in the wrong fuel tank or in the wrong piston on an engine or something like that might well bring an aircraft down, particularly at a height of 500 feet. Option two, you, you stick with it, you fly through the cloud and you hope that when you come out the other end, you're in roughly the right position. Option three is you, you gain height basically, um, which as again, in many cases meant the aircraft ascending to two and a half thousand feet, which is too high for a paradrop. So by the time the, the cloud cover ends, each option has got its dilemmas. The first option of dropping below the clouds means that you've not really got a, 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 a good view of the terrain ahead of you to determine where you are. With option two, you could very well come out of the cloud and look down at the terrain and go, where the hell are we? Um, we're not in the right position. Option three is you come out of the cloud at two and a half thousand feet, realize the drop zone is a mile and a half, two miles ahead of you, and have then got to get your aircraft down to the right jump height without gaining too much speed. And as I'm sure Seb could testify, in a C-47, that is impossible to do. Impossible to do. So the, the big the big dilemma for the air crews is at first what to do once they hit the cloud bank and then once they've dealt with the cloud bank is what to do once they come out the other side of it. So we know from the records that the cloud bank did disperse before the drop zones were reached but in terms of the, in terms of distances anywhere as low as a mile and a half which for an air crew it's incredibly difficult at that point in time to make the corrections necessary to carry out a, a drop, an accurate drop on the, on the correct drop zone, you know, at the correct speed. Yeah, absolutely, Adam, you, you, you're absolutely right. The, the Dakota doesn't like uh, to descend um, very easily. She's, she seems to be, 
very slippery in that respect. And there's also the consideration of uh, engine handling um, because of the variable pitch propellers uh, and, and the, the mating with the engine. A, a rule of thumb that we've got is that you have to have 100 RPM for each uh, inch of manifold air pressure on the engines, um, which means that uh, even, even you know uh, when we haven't got the pressures that those guys had, we generally descend at 1700 RPM with 17 inches of um, manifold air pressure. That isn't idle. That is just sensible in terms of keeping the engines going. Uh, but that, but because it's not idle, it means that she doesn't descend very, very well. And that's pretty much our max effort descent. So, so I, ca I, I can absolutely imagine that it would be very difficult to descend at Dakota at one and a half miles if, if you had to descend at like fifteen hundred feet. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there was one veteran, a guy called Julian Rice, who was um, again, he was he was three sixteenth who. In the post-war years, when he was he was one of the one of the uh, troop carrier air crew that became very proactive in trying to defend their performances on D-Day, and he said that that one of the ways that they determined that they could try and slow the aircraft down in a descent, or at very least try and maintain an airspeed in descent, was was to essentially put the engines into idle, um, so that the propeller was essentially spinning in the wind, because they claimed that what this created was almost an air brake effect. But having spoken recently to to, a, to another um, C forty seven pilot, he was saying that in terms of the health on the of the engine, that would have been pretty detrimental to the to the engine. But of, I mean, of course, these are considerations that they didn't really necessarily have to consider at the time because, you know, if, if they landed back at the airfield and some and a ground engineer came over and said, "Well, you've knackered that engine," they could put a new one on it. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think the point I was going to bring out was that it's not something that would cause an engine to fail very quickly. So if you were to view it as a single use aircraft in, in that the job was done by the time they got back, uh, albeit with, with trashed engines, then they, they, you know, that, that would have been acceptable, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, um, it was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you really was, was how, was, was how sort of, I mean, not that, you know, not that I'm, I'm questioning the, the uh, authority of a, of a troop carrier veteran, but you know how likely that sounds that the engine is idling in a descent, allowing the propellers to spin in the wind would 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 create a, an air brake effect. Um, his his claim was that because it, it it caused the propellers to sort of you know as I say spin in the wind, was that it, it kind of created the illusion that the engine was being pushed in a way the paratroopers on board might not have been too familiar with. Um, which again created this perception that the pilots were essentially trying to increase their airspeed um, approaching the drop zone, which of course we, you know, I think it's pretty clear they, we, they weren't trying to do or wouldn't have been trying to do. So yeah, it's, um, it was a question that I wanted to take the opportunity to put to you and see what your thoughts on that were. Uh, it's absolutely a valid assumption um, it, that if, if a propeller is being driven by the air, it acts as an air brake. Um, it's uh, a technique that is still used today on some propeller aircraft, and what those that are directly linked to the engine, um, because there are, there are two types of uh, turboprop uh, these days, ones that are called free turbines and ones that are called, uh, well, non-free turbines. Um, and uh, the, the shaft, the difference is that if there's a physical shaft connecting the engine to the prop, it's, it's not a, a free turbine. Most of the modern ones operate that the jet efflux from the small um, jet engine is almost driving a windmill behind the engine, which then has a shaft that runs through the engine to the propeller and it rotates that way. It means that there's no direct link between the engine itself and the propeller. Um, but if you do have that direct link, which clearly you do in the, in, in the Dakota, uh, it is absolutely a, a valid theory, assuming that you're not particularly worried about the health or longevity of the engine um, beyond the current flight that you're on, that that would cr create quite a lot of drag, which you could either use to descend at the same speed or slow down, uh, or a combination of the two. So it, it is absolutely a valid theory. And yeah, definitely. And the dynamics of the aircraft don't necessarily correlate with the sound of the engines, do they? Uh, it's not. It's not particularly that. I think what uh, what he may have been referring to was the fact that if 
the engines are running at, uh, if, if the props are set to a certain RPM, that if you're using them to create drag, there will be the, all this energy going into the prop, which may cause it to spin faster, which would then mean that it would give the oral illusion that power was being applied to the aircraft, as opposed to them wanting to slow down. So, so it would, it's almost like uh, when, when you're going downhill in a car, in a manual car, and you change down a couple of gears the en and use the engine braking, the engine sounds as if it's working harder, uh, but you're not going any faster. You're, you're, you're almost changing down a gear in, in this situation. Yeah, I think, I, I think that was the impression that, that Julian Rice was trying to give, um, was, that, was that the paratroopers on board would perceive it to be that the engines were essentially being gunned by the pilot or, you know, they were applying more power to the engines in order to, well, as, as, as a lot of the paratroopers have, 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 have claimed to, to avoid flak or to essentially create, create themselves a quicker, a quicker run out of the, uh, the danger zone for want of better terminology. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great to hear that from you, you know, someone that's got experience on the aircraft to, to hear that, that, you know, that's very much something that these pilots could have, you know, could have called upon. Another thing that he mentioned was that they tried to, um, you know, they tried to essentially destroy whatever, you know, sort of minimal aerodynamic properties that the aircraft's got by lowering flaps. Um, they also said that kicking the rudder would have a, an effect on, on potentially slowing the aircraft down. But, but generally speaking, the, you know, the, the, the comfort's not the right word, but the comfort of the paratroopers on board would be quite, you know, negatively affected by all of, all of this that's going on. Which, which again could have led to the perception that the air crew was sort of, you know, actively trying to dodge, dodge flak, which is one of the big arguments on D-Day, which, which I, I've argued, you know, obviously speaking from a, from, from a position of having never experienced it myself, surely isn't possible, you know, particularly back in those days when the, the worry was that, you know, anything that was flying into the air in front of your aircraft is not really what you need to be worried about, it's what you can't see. Um, that's that's a bigger concern, and and being able to to avoid flak, particularly small arms fire, seems you know seems very unlikely to me. It would have been very unlike, unlikely that they could have avoided small arms fire because you just wouldn't be able to see it. N not not just because it was night, you wouldn't be able to see it during the day either. The the flak could be a valid argument in that if there was an area of concentrated flak, they could maneuver to avoid the area where the flak was being concentrated because they would see the explosions. From the anti-aircraft fire but but I, I think probably the the feeling of the aircraft maneuvering a lot was probably down to them trying to manage the energy that, that was in the aircraft at the time you mentioned about uh, lowering flap if it's anything like the air, airdrops that i've done from dakota we have to slow down sufficiently to to drop the paratroopers because clearly we're not we don't want to throw them out into 150 mile an hour wind if we can fly slower um so we would we would generally drop in the dakota around about 95 knots roughly just over 100 miles an hour and to fly that slow in a dakota for to, to create a, a sufficient margin of lift you would have to to lower flat um, another thing that you mentioned was was side with the reason the rudder uh, and and it's a technique called side slip where if you put in a bootful of rudder in one direction and a handful of air, aileron to roll the aircraft in the other direction you can keep the aircraft going straight but you're presenting you're, you're almost flying sideways through the air, which is presenting more of a, 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 a forward facing drag element, if you like, because you, some of the side of the aircraft is now facing forwards. So you can use that drag to slow the aircraft down. And again, if you've, if you've got lots of drag, it's like what we discussed about the propeller. It's you, if you've got the drag, you can use that to slow down or go down or a mixture of both, but not to as great a degree. So, um, you know, all of those things definitely ring true in terms of, of, of piloting the aircraft. What is the effect of having people jumping out the back due to the aircraft when you're flying it? I suppose you, 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 you have some experience in this, but maybe not to the, the weights that those chaps were on that. No, I mean, we tend to drop uh, fewer than 10 paratroopers in, in one pass, but I, I just... I, I haven't actually dropped from the Dakota in a few years now, but what I, I definitely firmly remember uh, the first para, para drop that I did uh, or, or flew from, from Dakota was the sensation that you could feel the weight moving in the back. Now, coming from the C-130 where, you know, I, I've done 
sort of simulate uh, sorry uh, simultaneous sticks of around about 30 people so six, 60 paratroopers jumping out the back in one pass you wouldn't notice that effect at all in in the c-130 you'd hear some noise because paratroopers tend to have heavy boots but um <laughs> you, uh, in the dakota you could actually feel the 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 effect on the controls of the people moving towards the back and then jump, jumping out of the aircraft, albeit re- relatively faintly, it's the fact that you could feel it at, at all, you know. And that that was something that's that's definitely something that sticks in my mind from from those drops. I think it was my second drop was was at uh, from the Dakota was was at Ronville uh, on D Day seventy, and, and and you know clearly the. The memory of uh, dropping paratroopers onto a D-Day drop zone uh, 70 years to the day later was um, was pretty special. You know, um, cer- certainly uh, an experience that I'll never forget. I, I didn't get to go for 75 the other year, but a colleague of mine did and sent me some video of of the drop. And it it is certainly moving. It must have been incredible to, to do it. D Day seventy five was was done by another one of our, our pilots. Uh, I, I actually did D Day seventy, which was you know, and to, and to be honest, they're, they're both um, uh, amazing events. You know, um, it's I, I'm not I'm not too ashamed to say this. It's it's one of the very few times that I felt quite emotional flying an aircraft because of what she symbolised in in that she was a Dakota and where she was and what day it was. You know, uh, all those things added together. It, if 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 that doesn't make you feel in some way uh, emotional, then there's there's definitely something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but that's just this the, the return trip is something that I don't think I've ever read anything about because it, the story sort of fo- follows the aircraft in. They they drop their sticks, and then the story drops with them into into the chaos that was that night. What what happened to the aircraft on the way back? Because by my reckoning, they're flying towards a lot of ships with a lot of guns pointed upwards as they're coming across the eastern coast of the, the peninsula. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, they were very, very, very much trying to avoid what happened over Sicily um, because the, the vast majority of the C-47s that were shot down in the friendly fire incident over Sicily were, um, were from the US Navy. So any of the pilots, particularly from the 52nd wing, who dropped elements of the 82nd over Normandy, who had, who had experienced the friendly fire incident over Sicily, might have felt a little bit twitchy about flying over the, the US Navy again. Of course, we know that this is the reason why, why, the, why the, um, the Allied Air Forces adopted the invasion stripes on the aircraft um, as a recognition symbol for aircraft that flew up, that op- operated below a certain, um, a certain ceiling. Um, as a recognition symbol to the to the ground gunners to know that these were um, these were going to be uh, friendly aircraft, but that said, it was still you know th- there was still a lot of planning put in place to make sure that the naval gunners knew that um, that any aircraft sort of egressing from that side of, of Normandy were, were were friendly. Believe it or not, the, the troop carrier aircrew were, were, were almost given the option of, uh, of, of every man for, for himself once the paratroopers were, were out of the aircraft. They, they Obviously, they maintained a formation to some extent, but some guys dropped their aircraft down to, you know, 100 feet off the deck, you know, just to, um, to try and um, alleviate the, the effects of, of the German anti-aircraft fire, you know, because, I, I mean, I, I, I've been lucky enough to, to have been on the ground in Normandy and have a C-47 fly, I would be amazed if it was 100 feet over my head. And even though it's C-47 and it's not flying particularly quickly, it's been and gone before you know it's it's happened. And, and I, I would guess that they were trying to achieve something similar. So a lot of the guys dropped it right down to the deck and they were flying really, really low over the Navy as well. You know, for a lot of them, it wasn't, you know, that wasn't the end of it. Um, we got a couple of, couple of guys that ditched their aircraft in the channel on the flight on the flight back a couple of particularly nasty stories actually about guys that um i mean obviously the aircrew just like every other aircrew they were trained on ditching they were trained what to do they were trained how to deploy life rafts and how to board the life rafts from the aircrafts from the aircrafts um, escape hatches or from the main cargo door you know at night in a situation that you know is a little bit hairy for these guys that might have suffered a you know quite a bit of flak damage you know, panic can often set in, and there was one aircraft in particular, and I'm try- I, 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 I cannot remember the, the, the crew 
the guy's name, but he jumped from his aircraft, from the aircraft's cargo door, and um, not into the life raft, and was bobbing around in the in the ocean, and um, got carried underneath the aircraft's wing. And as the aircraft was undulating on the on the rough sea, the, the wing basically just came down and and, and killed him um, whilst he was in, in the surf. Um, so so once this you know once the paratroopers were dropped, it was by no means over for these guys. A lot of them landed on uh, airfields along the southern coast of England because the, the, the damage basically to their aircraft meant that they stood very little chance or of getting back to their home airfields or it was safer, a safer option for them to land at these airfields and assess damage. RAF Ford was one that was, was, was considered a, an emergency landing field for troop carrier aircraft, so quite a number landed there. And, um, and some of them spent, you know, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours at these airfields whilst their aircraft were either being inspected for damage or being repaired before flying back to their, their airfields. But of course, the big thing for them was that the job was was only half done. I mean, they'd, they'd got the paratroopers down, but they, they had to get the glider infantry down and the glider field artillery battalions and all of the support units that come with it. You know, they so they were back at their airfields. Some of them were in bed for five, six hours, and then up again, towing gliders to Normandy over territory that's riddled with Germans that this time know you're coming and have got broad daylight on their side to um, fire at your aircraft. So the stress levels must have been absolutely intense for these guys. And, you know, and as, as, as we mentioned just before we, we started the podcast, Matt, the, you know, these guys had one, uh, one hit at this job. They had to get it right first time. They didn't get a chance to try again the next day or the day after that. So, again, stress levels must have been pretty peak for them. I, th- I, th- I think it's fascinating because that's an- another point that we don't tend to realise is that there was this continual flow of subsequent subsequent waves, resupply. It wasn't the case of these guys doing the drop and then putting their feet up and and, and waiting for Market Garden, was it? I think it was. It, it's really interesting to talk about the versatility of the of, of the Dakota. You know, so on the on the night of D Day, it was dropping paratroopers. The following days, it was towing gliders. Uh, there were aeromedical evacuation missions flown. You know, in, in fact, the, the the Dakota that our aircraft is painted to represent, Quichabitchin, has got you know aeromedical mission. Uh, insignia on the side on the side of it so there was also the resupply there was the cargo drop so there's so much that the Dakota could do and and, and it did it all relatively well it was um, pretty much uh, a jack of all trades and the master of most as well which 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 is is a rare thing within aircraft to to, to be honest and, and that's that's the thing that that uh, surprises me most most about how how successful the Dakota was because it could do all of that and more, which, which was which was very impressive. You know, I certainly know that the air, the, the airfield where Quichabitchin was based. I hasten to add, not our actual aircraft, but the aircraft she's painted to represent, uh, is, is only just up the road from me. It's it was um, at RAF Blakehill Farm, uh, and obviously Down Ampney is not too far either. Uh, and, and if you go to go to these places now, certainly in the case of Blake Hill Farm, it's a nature reserve, and there is a, a, a display panel there covering the role of Blake Hill Farm during during that period of time, and and it, it just shows that the, the the Dakota was such a, a key part of the war effort, and and in my in my opinion, she's often forgotten about. She doesn't hold the same fame as as. You know, our big girl, the the Lank or uh, the Spitfire or the Hurricane, but arguably she had just as great, if not greater, effect on on the outcome. It's one of our regular things: logistics wins wars. I would tend I would tend to agree with that, and 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 I don't believe that that has changed over time either. You know, in the in the modern day Air Force, the the, the large logistic aircraft are, are the ones that seem to have the greater effect than than the fighters or, or uh, I mean maybe, maybe the bombers have a great effect but the fighters are uh, um, don't don't seem to have as great an effect and certainly during my time in in various recent conflicts we we've been a, 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 a pretty valuable asset in terms of moving people around uh, and, and the fast jets whilst clearly 
uh, indispensable uh, to the overall campaign seem, seem to have not as great an effect, uh, if I dare say so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd agree with you, logistics do win wars. And the fighters cause people's tiles to blow off when they're r r racing north to, to, to have a look at the Russians. I could possibly <laughs> <can't>. <laughs> Let's let's we we we've, we've been we've been going for a while now. This has been absolutely fascinating, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stretch it out for a little bit longer. But we are gonna wrap up at the same time um, to let you guys get on. It is supper time. Um, what did the ninth get up to next? Were they at? Did they fly Market Garden and Varsity later on in 1945? Uh, yeah. Well, bef before that, as Seb quite rightly pointed out, um, each wing in the um, in the command had a. Uh, what they called a medical air evacuation transport squadron. So it was predominantly about 95% female personnel nurses and uh, and supplemented by a number of surgeons or doctors. And from around about um, sort of mid to late June 44, they were flying medical air evacuation flights to Normandy, flying the more sort of um, critically urgent patients back to, back to England, back to the uh, general hospitals in England. And it's a role actually that so in 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 my book with with hands we we did a special section on the nurses because again they're often overlooked and you know I've got a bit of a soft spot for them really because I think that the job they did was was absolutely critical to um, to the, the campaign in Normandy and the treatment of, of casualties and 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 they had a particularly you know we've we've read lots of stories about them having a very calming effect on the, on the guys that they flew back on the C forty sevens and. Um, so there was that, and of course, yes, uh, Market Garden. Market Garden was a huge one for Nine Troop Carrier Command because not only did they drop the um, the parachute elements of the 82nd and the 101st, they also dropped almost every parachute element of British First Airborne Division to Arnhem, with the exception of the 21st Independent um, Company uh, Parachute Company, um, who flew on. Um, uh, well, I believe it was Halifax's from Fairford. They dropped, yeah, they dropped almost every every Allied paratrooper that, that jumped into Market Garden was flown on aircraft of of Ninth Troop Carrier Command, and they're judged on it um, pretty well actually compared to Normandy. Um, the drops were obviously it was the first major daylight drop of World War Two, so success wise it was it was it was well up there. The only sort of re um, sort of regularly debated argument is is why the um, the British would drop so far from their objectives. But um, that's another story altogether. I have a, an opinion on that, whether or not now's the right time to bring it up, I don't know. Nine Troop Carrier Command were also pretty instrumental um, during the Battle of the Bulge because they provided aerial resupply missions as part of Operation Repulse to the uh, 101st Airborne Division that were obviously surrounded uh, at Bastogne. Um, suffered quite a few, quite a few heavy losses during that during that mission in terms of aircraft and air crew, aircraft going down with their crew on board. Um, and then of course they they were involved in the in the in the big one, Operation Varsity at the end of the war, which incidentally saw the first I was I was gonna bring this up when when Seb mentioned the versatility of the, the C forty seven and obviously it's an aircraft that, that carried out power drops from Operation Torch in November nineteen forty two all the way forward to Operation Varsity in May nineteen forty five. So over three years worth of service in terms of airborne insertion but Varsity was the first use of the Curtis C-46 Commando which was a a monster of an aircraft but you know in comparison designed to be a four-engine aircraft had a bigger wingspan than a, than a B-17 and the C-47 completely outshone it in uh, in Varsity um, the C-46 suffered horrendous losses there was only one group that flew it operationally which was a the 314th, and they lost 19 aircraft in one day flying the Varsity mission. Um, the C-46 could not stand flak at all. It was it was terrible. It was terrible for it. And yeah, like I say... Unvented wing as well, so that when she was hit, the fuel, fuel just pulled underneath the fuselage, so it just turned into a blowtorch. Absolutely, and, and it, had, it had exposed electrical points, all sorts didn't have self-sealing tanks, which a lot of the C-47s had been fitted with by that stage of the war. Um, and, and during Varsity, the, the percentage of, of, of C-46s shot down, as opposed to the percentage of C-47s shot down, 
you know, they're, they're, they, 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 they can't really be compared. They're sort of so different. Um, and again, the C-47 outshone it. And the, the C-46, C-46, sorry, performed so poorly during Varsity that its future as a, as a, as a platform for deploying paratroopers was, was destroyed on that day. Matthew Ridgway, who by that point, you know, former 82nd Airborne Division commander who later went on, at that point was commanding the 18th Airborne Corps, basically said it should never be used to deploy paratroopers again. And when you look at the, the, the development of troop carrying aircraft with the US Air Force, it almost disappears, which the C-47 doesn't. The C-47 continues its career in the post-war years as a platform for deploying paratroopers until it's replaced, you know, around about the time of career with the flying box car, which again, I have my opinions about because it's one of the ugliest aircraft ever made. And, <laughs> um, and it replaced one of the most beautiful aircraft ever made. So um, there you go. But um, these changes happen, don't they? Yeah. Aesthetics do tend to go out the window, but then it was replaced in turn by the C-130, which is a beautiful aircraft. Yeah, that is a nice aircraft. I, I agree, but I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, but we're not we're not saying that just to buddy you up. So. Yeah, the, the varsity. I think we need to, we need to do a, a show on that because it's it's fantastic. Um, just in not just in scale, but the the the, the size of the scale is size, isn't it? Just the, the stories on it because that was one of the moving things. I remember reading Frank Johnson's logbook when he flew the Typhoon Projects Typhoon in flak suppression missions. He didn't note in his logbook what he got up to. He just noted the flaming transports going down. And for, for a fighter pilot to put that in his logbook as opposed to what his score was on the ground is, <laughs> yeah. is quite something. It's funny because, I mean, you, you may be familiar with a film called Theirs is Their Glory, um, or Theirs is the Glory, um, which was a post-war film about Market Garden from the first Airborne Division's perspective. And other, you know, a lot of original Market Garden footage was used in there. Um, but it's funny, in that film, an awful lot of footage of aircraft going down is footage of C-46 aircraft going down during varsity. But because they all went down, dare I say, in a big way, there was very few that actually managed to crash land. They all went down in a big way in flames. As, 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 as bad as it sounds, it makes for good footage in a war film. You know, so it just goes to show, you know, what, what, what the effect, you know, of, um, of flak had on the aircraft and, and, and the way it was perceived in the years that followed. So let's put this to bed. The best troops dropped by the worst crews. True or false? Absolutely false. There are huge misconceptions surrounding the misdrops on D-Day. You know, as, as I, I've tried to put it um, in, in the past, there's, there's no cases of cowardice. There's no, it's, you know, it's not a lack of training. It's not a lack of, you know, it's not that, you know, the pilots weren't acting in the best interest of self-preservation. It's a situation that was, was, absolutely ruined or you know destroyed by by a cloud bunk they weren't expecting and they spent the remainder of the mission trying to rectify the situation from that point forward so the, the way that the air crew behaved from that point forward was them trying to do the best job they could given the circumstances that they were they were they were, they were faced with there we go right now we're going to get we're going to raise raise the tone a little bit seb what does 2021 look like for the Battle of Britain Memorial flight? We are so hoping we get to see a lot of you this year, once we all get our jabs, of course. Well, we're, we're, we're quietly hopeful. You know, it will, it will depend very much on uh, the appetite of uh, air show organisers to, to go ahead. Uh, clearly, they're having to make decisions around about now about whether their events are going to go ahead because the significant planning that goes into an air show. You know, understandably, uh, the really big air show that is react they've decided not to uh, not not to run their show this year and it's a totally understandable decision at this range because they they without a doubt knowing the team that are involved in that they left it as late as they possibly could and would have run it if it had been all, at all possible for them to do so uh, other shows uh, have, have delayed a little bit so i think cosford have announced that their air show is going to be in september rather than uh, traditionally towards um, close to the start of the year but, but we're quietly hopeful we're, we're hoping that there will be um, a strong appetite for the shows to go ahead and and you'll be able to see our our beautiful aircraft in front of you again soon and we also need to this because we were both me very tangentially involved with young jack berry's book flying high in the sunlit silence which has been actually the highlight of my lockdown has been chatting to 
Jack and, and Sarah about this book. Could you just give me a quick plug for them because it is it's a lovely work of work of art. By well, absolutely, it's a it's a fantastic book and it, it shows uh, what is some quite obvious artistic talent of uh, a young 13, 13 year old boy who most people may think was was incapable of, of doing such things and um, it, all you have to do is look through the book and see some of the wonderful art that, that Jack has created uh, covering our, one of our favourite subjects which is aviation you know so he's, he's drawn pictures of uh, our Lancaster, the Dakota, Spitfires, uh, there are modern aircraft like the A400 as well, the Hercules, to be honest, it's, it is a who's who of, of modern aviation, well, in fact, not even modern, but aviation masterpieces over the years. So, so uh, it's thoroughly worth a read. All of the captions for Jack's art have been written by people connected with the airframes depicted. Um, and, and I would thoroughly recommend it. And it's available from Amazon. Yes. And that's Flying High in the Sunlit Silence by Jack Berry. Guess it, everybody. There's a lovely picture of typhoon rb396 in there as well i can't do one of these podcasts without mentioning that typhoon as my blood sweat and tears are tangentially linked to that as well but it's lovely i i got to put sarah in touch with um harry hardy's family in canada so that's Her harry's pictures are in there and his his little caption for the typhoon as well which was was really nice to do as harry sadly passed away just before before we were able to do that so it's a nice tribute to him but gentlemen thank you so much um adam your book where can people get it it's a hefty tome but let's make sure people know it's there um the only place i can buy it actually is on the publisher's website which is www.overlord-publishing.com what's it called it's called a breathtaking spectacle it's um i, I probably should have said what it was called. always handy <laughs> it's called a breathtaking spectacle it's um it's volume one in a three volume series about ninth troop carrier command in uh, operating from england in world war ii um, so volume one's about the 52nd troop carrier wing and we're currently about 50 percent through on the uh, on volume two which is about the uh, 53rd troop carrier wing so there's about not i think there's between 900 and a thousand original wartime photographs in there a huge portion of which have never seen light of day before, really. So, um, if you, if even for those who just like looking at pictures of C forty sevens, it's it's worth a it's worth a look. Can I just say thank you very much to Adam? It's, a, it's been hugely fascinating to to listen to you, and you're clearly extremely knowledgeable on the subject. And um, it, it's just very hugely interesting for me. So, so even even being part of the podcast, I have definitely learned uh, a lot of good stuff today. Thank you very much, Adam. Well, thanks. So from you, that means a great deal to me. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure listening to you talk about, you know, the, the, the uh, flying the aircraft and, you know, the various nuances that come with it. So, yeah, it's been great fun for me. Fabulous. And thanks to both of you for making me look good, which is the point of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're capable of doing that yourself now, Matt. You, you know your stuff when it comes to typhoons, don't you? So. In that case, that bit's definitely staying in the edit. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. And we'll be back in the future with more episodes. In the meantime, go buy Jack Berry's book because all the proceeds for that go to SAFA, the International Bom Bomber Command Center. And the. Uh, it's uh, the Lincolnshire Lancaster. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I'd like to thank the Battle Brit Memorial Flight and Seb for joining us today. That was wonderful. Thank you so much to them. And of course, to Adam Berry, whose books you can buy at overlord-publishing.com. One thing we did miss out was that Adam has started a coffee company. The Warbird Coffee Company has created coffees and teas that will go to support restoration projects around the UK, including Hawker Typhoon RB396. So be sure to check them out at warbirdcoffeecompany.com and support some great projects happening right now. Also remember, you can buy books at our very own History Hack bookshop head to bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack to pick up the latest books from our guests and some special ones including jason selke's book about the filming of the sharp series it's quite amazing you never know jason had a book out head over to there and pick it up straight away
In 2020, when the boss ladies Alex and Alina started History Hack, the world was very strange. And unfortunately, it looks like 2021 is going to be equally strange. We would love it if you're able to support the podcast in any way. It will allow us to keep up the regularity of the pods and also the great guests that we've been able to bring you over the last year. We exist on Patreon as History Hack and also on Podbean, our podcast host's own platform called Patreon. The reward tiers are being updated at the moment, so there's going to be some fantastic options for you to choose from. So if you're able to support us, that would be fantastic. So we thank you very much and until the next time.